What I wanted to do is do two things. One is to give a little bit of a, a background to the state of the forests as they exist at the moment, and then some perspectives on restoration. So just to give you a little bit of background, in the last 25 years, we've lost nearly 80% of old growth in the state, nearly 80%. We've seen huge areas of regeneration failure, not only after recurrent fire, this is in northeastern Victoria, but also extensively in logged areas. We've also seen extensive losses of biodiversity. The size and the frequency of fire is increasing quite dramatically across Victoria. We see that some places are burning three or four times in the last 25 years that should burn only once every 75 to 150 years. So there's some really serious thinking to be done about what's going on. Why are things changing? One is the climate's clearly changing. There's no doubt about that and the link to fire is quite clear. We also know that log forests are more flammable. But the other thing that's starting to emerge is that some kinds of hazard reduction burning can actually make forests more flammable than less. This is what the data shows, is that a logged forest always burns at higher severity than an intact forest, always. And that logged forests burning under moderate fire weather still burn at higher severity than intact forests burn under extreme conditions. So the difference that's created by logging in these forests is really quite marked. And so that effect lasts for between 40 and 70 years after the forest has been regenerated. It's quite a problem. So what are we doing about these really extensive flammable forests that have been made more flammable dating back at least 70 years? Some people are saying, let's get out there and thin the forest. Well, let's have a look at the data. So we looked at the data after the 2009 fires and then in a separate analysis after the 2019-20 fires. And the answer is that thinning either makes very little difference or in some cases it actually makes the forest more flammable than it was before. Yes, hazard reduction burns seem to be effective for about five to seven years after the burn has been done. But what we see is that there's an increase in the risk of high severity fire for up to 50 years. The important thing about hazard reduction burning is it's the, the quality that matters and high quality hazard reduction burns are done very close to people and property because that's the thing that you want to protect. The second thing that's important is that we have extensive areas of failed forest regeneration and we've got to work really hard to be able to put a lot of that regeneration back. The trees have got to be put back in place. We've got to restore the natural fire regime. We need to focus our hazard reduction burning in places where it really matters. And we've really got to do a lot of work to recover iconic species. And the greater glider is one of them. And it really is an extraordinary animal. It's something that we've worked on for a very, very long period of time. And it's like a small guiding koala. It actually doesn't move much in the forest and it's got very bright eye shine. So it's actually a wonderful animal to be able to spotlight but it's also very vulnerable. It's what we call a sentinel species. It doesn't like land clearing. It doesn't like logging. It's sensitive to fire. It's actually sensitive to hazard reduction burning as well because it's very heat sensitive, which also means that it's sensitive to climate change. With fire, we see a big decline in their tree hollows, but also with hazard reduction burning, hazard reduction burning tends to take out a lot of hollow trees as well. So we need to be very careful about where we apply those hazard reduction burns because they can not only change the fire dynamics in forests, but they can take out really important parts of habitat. So these negative effects are really quite important. Hazard reduction burns that get too hot can kill greater gliders, just like in Western Australia where hazard reduction burns killed most of the remaining population of the endangered Western ringtail possum. Since 1997, We've seen the, the number of greater glider sites and the number of greater gliders overall decline catastrophically, nearly 80% now. So this animal is in free fall. So these, these are real data. This is not modelled. This is counts of the numbers of animals on sites in the forest. 
And one of the key things is the big trees that these animals need to nest in. Forests that have lots of these really big trees are fundamentally important to the survival of these animals. What we see is that the population of these big trees is crashing dramatically. And we have measured this repeatedly since 1983. So that is a trajectory for the loss of these big trees. These are trees that take 170 to 400 years to develop. So what do we see? About a 90% decline in total abundance of these big trees by 2035. And if you go back into the historical documents, which we've been doing in the last few weeks, you discover from about 1928 onwards, there were deliberate policies from the Forest Commission of Victoria to liquidate old growth. So you're liquidating a lot of greater gliders in the process. How are we going to recover this iconic animal? And it truly is a fantastic creature, amazing animal. So we've been studying where do these things occur in the forest and why they occur where they do. We know where the gliders used to be. And we've been tracking the gliders through time. We know where they used to be and where they're no longer been. Even just in the last couple of years, we've seen where they disappeared. So these are fantastic places to think about recovery. So we need to work out where is it coolest in the forest because that's where greater gliders are going to be. And we've also been working on the next generation of nest boxes. So how do we design nest boxes so that greater gliders don't cook in them during the day? Remember what a tree does. A tree not only fixes carbon, it actually takes water from the soil and it pumps it up through the tree to the top of the tree. In the case of mountain ash forest, nearly 100 metres off the ground. That water is actually a big insulative cooling jacket that keeps the hollows cool. That's what we have to replicate with these nest boxes. And we have to put them up high enough in the trees because gliders don't fly. They volplane. They, they glide from one spot to the next. They lose elevation as they go, climb up the tree and glide again. And the nest hollows need to be very high in the tree. So we've got to put the nest boxes up very high as well. So we've thought about all these things. Where did the gliders used to be? Where are the coolest parts of the forest? What sort of nest boxes do we need? Where do we need to put the nest boxes? These are glider specific boxes. Our approach is to bring this wonderful animal back using good science, using good support from people in the community and building on the last 40 years of work to really try to make this a success.